Let me tell you a story about my two neighbors. On one side, I have a neighbor who has this beautiful daughter, sweet, sweet, innocent child. And one year for her birthday, she received a kitten. And she loved this cat more than anything in the world, more than her parents, which, you know, it's a cat. But the reason she got up every morning was to feed and play with this cat. One day, she forgot the front door, and the cat escaped. And sadly, the kitten was hit by a car and passed away. Now, what some of you are feeling is a sense of sympathy and empathy for this poor, innocent child. These are amazing traits and abilities that we have. A lot of times, DevOps talks have empathy in them, and we try to explain what empathy is. I wanted to see if you could feel what empathy was. Now, here's the interesting thing. On the other side, I have a different neighbor. Now, he's a 150-year-old man who goes out to get his paper in the mornings wearing nothing but an untied bathrobe. And I mean nothing but an untied bathrobe. You learn pretty quick in my house to stay clear of the windows between 7 and 8 a.m. on a weekday. Well, one day he goes out and the paper's not there. He was devastated. I mean, his whole reason for getting up, the only thing he had to look forward to was this paper and his morning cup of coffee. Now, both of these people have experienced loss, and to them, it's a big loss. But we're going to feel a different level of empathy for them, because empathy is based on presuppositions, former bias, now, I know what you're thinking. Well, Paulie, it's easy to feel empathy for a sweet, innocent child, and maybe not so much for my boss, who I think is a pompous know-it-all blowhard that I want to shove down an elevator shaft, theoretically speaking. And you're right. You may also be thinking, oh, great, another talk about empathy. This isn't a talk about empathy, but I do believe that empathy is important and has been a critical ingredient to my success over the last four years. So I just wanted to talk about it very quickly, recognize that it's still important. I don't think it's jumped the shark yet, but I do feel like, to some degree, a lot of people are starting to feel this way. So if empathy isn't the most important aspect of long-term systemic positive change, what is? Well, quite simply, it's, it's you. How you approach change is critical to successful change, not only in your organization, but inside yourself. Because if we want successful organizational change, we have to have successful change in ourselves. Now, a lot of times you can't necessarily control that emotional response. Right? Your knee-jerk first response to things are almost always emotional. But you can control everything from that point forward. The decisions that you make, the actions that you take, that defines how you respond. Now, I've found that combining a simple sense of empathy with just a dash of humor can help to de-escalate situations and create a positive working environment where people can take some risks and embrace change. Now, don't worry, you don't have to be funny. Lord knows. Uh, Life gives you all the comedic information you need. If you don't believe me, go back to your office next Monday and just look around for a bit. Life is kind of ludicrous, right? So just kind of embrace that. Now, when I first started learning about this lesson of sort of combining a little bit of humor with a little bit of empathy was when I was a developer. Uh, I was uh, doing C and C++ about 100 years ago. Thank you. Somebody else is a C. Somebody knows what C is. Um, and here's the thing is, you know, I had a boss, and I kind of felt like my boss was maybe a little too old, maybe a little too out of touch to understand what I was going through, right? We'd, we'd get into arguments and disagreements, and I'd say things like, you're not my real dad, and I'd leave and slam the door, and all the things you do when you're young, right, as a developer. See, the problem was, I kind of felt like my boss was here, and I was there. And it was a sliding scale. Now, it wasn't until later that I realized I became a manager, and I, the tactics that he was using were so incredibly successful that I didn't even realize he was using them. So he had a steady influx of change. But we never knew that we were supposed to fear change. You see, it was still hard, it was difficult, it was disruptive. 
but we just thought it was part of what we were doing, part of who we were. And that was all because he did all of this with just a little bit of empathy and a little bit of humor. And I was like, that's what I want to do. That's who I want to emulate. That's who I want to be as a manager now. This little dip right here, that's just the JavaScript chasm I had to claw my way out of. <laughs> I thought I was going to be the only one. So let's sort of set the stage for what we're talking about here. I had a four-year mission uh, at a company called Hearst. Hearst has over 360 individual businesses. And we wanted to transform how we built software, deployed software, and managed and maintained it. Four years on, we had 70 successful total engagements, all dealing with things here on the left-hand side, right? So these are all transformational changes. I got to work with amazing engineers, over 2,000. This is my success rate over the last four years. Now, you notice in the beginning here, it's not that great. Part of that's inexperience without knowing the company and starting to learn and grow and build some trust and relationships. But here's the thing. I was really, really focused on hitting the business metrics. I really wanted the id of leadership to be satisfied. And they were. If you were to look at this, in fact, if I were to overlay management's view of success, it would be much higher in the beginning. But again, remember, I don't live and breathe with these business units. So the problem was when I would leave and move on to the next transformational change of 70, they would start to slide backwards. They would start to move back to things that were more within their comfort zone. So in essence, I was failing long term, but winning short term. So how was I measuring this success then? Well, pretty simply, the first measure of success was, were they still practicing this six months down the road? This was incredibly important because I needed them to not only sort of change their short-term behavior, which actually is pretty easy to do with hard power, right? But I needed them to change their mindset. And you can't really do that with hard power. You have to do that with influence, understanding, and support. The next was, were we able to increase value without sacrificing value? A trite example of this would be, you know, were we able to increase velocity without impacting quality, right? Moving faster in the wrong direction is still the wrong thing to do. Were we able to adopt and then adapt? For a lot of these businesses, this was a brand new initiative. And these were usually very big swings for the fence, moving off a monolithic code base, changing from waterfall to agile. Almost all of them moved to the cloud. And we're doing all this simultaneously, so it's a lot of change. And lastly, continuous improvement over static transformation. This feeds right back into the first one, which is really all about, were they able to embrace this change long term and say, this is who we are now, rather than it just being sort of reluctant adherence because I have to, because Paulie said so? Now, I said that the most important aspect of any change is you. I was asked several times to share what I was doing and how I was able to move from mediocre success to maybe 90%. You'll notice I didn't hit 100%. In fact, I don't think I would ever hit 100% success rate at that scale. And the problem was I, I didn't really know how to do that. I didn't know how to share what I was doing because I was just kind of being me, right? I just walked in and said, hey, tell me where your pain points are. Let's sit down and talk about it. Let's figure out a path together. So a lot of that is collaborative. A lot of it's soft skills, a lot of the things we're talking about. And I had to continue to measure my success for the business on tactical goals. So about 10 months ago, I started writing down everything I was doing. Not just the how and the what, but the why. And not just the contextual why it was important, but why did I choose this path over the other? A lot of times it was bias, right? This worked for me before, so why wouldn't I try it again? After about eight months, I started to culminate all this data to try and put it into a couple of buckets, to try and boil this down to right, Paulie's three easy steps to successful change. Um, and it's funny because I never read books that have numbers in their title. Uh, 
but I didn't want it to be sort of a Tony Robbins thing either, right? It wasn't, it wasn't going to be a rah-rah empowering thing. It had to be something you could actually put into practice. And it turns out it's actually quite easy. And I mean, everything that I'm doing here, there's nothing magical about what I'm doing. Everyone in the audience is as smart or smarter than me easily. You can do all of these things. It's just that we tend to not focus on them because we get so wrapped around the axle of trying to get those metrics, those business metrics, which are important. But we want to take a more holistic approach so that the change outlives us. I mean, there's nothing about me, nor it should there be, that means I can't leave and someone else can't step in and take over. I mean, I'm not that, I'm not that funny or, or athletic or, or good looking or, or s smart or, or ta talented. I don't know where I'm going with this, but so when we get back to the framework, <laughs> so it's pretty simple. Three easy steps to successful change. So I ended up there anyway, right? Discover the culture. Discover the person. Now, notice I say person here and not people. And the reason for that is I'm talking about individuals making change happen, not resources making change happen. And arguably the most important, discover the value. Now, this framework had to work well for me if we were just kicking off a transformation. For in a lot of cases, we were doing things that these companies have never done before. It was terrifying in a lot of ways. And it felt like there was a lot of risk. So trying to lower that threshold and that feeling and sense of risk was important. But equally important was when we were halfway through a change, or maybe we just finished a change, and people were starting to fall back into that comfort zone, slipping into sort of old, familiar, comfortable habits. So that meant this framework had to incorporate all of these sorts of approaches. Now, working for this many businesses, meant that the first time I walked through their doors, I was brand new. There was no trust. They didn't know who I was. In fact, sometimes they saw me as a corporate spy, which is a pretty natural way to think about it. I want to protect mine. I want to protect my people, my ideas, my way of life, my process. If you come in and say I have to change all of that, that's very threatening. So the first thing I did was really work to try and understand their culture. And not just the, the macro culture, the one that the leadership wants the world to see, but the micro culture, the one that exists within the team, the people you work with day in and day out. That's the one that really matters, right? And how I went about doing this was quite simple. I just would get a notebook, I would sit down, I would shut up, I would observe and write things down. Yes, I could shut up for brief periods of time, this just isn't one of them. Now, here's the thing, too, is I, I wasn't creepy about it, right? I wasn't, like, hiding behind the bushes, you know, in the break room like David Attenborough in Wild Kingdom or something. I got out there. I wanted to experience what they were experiencing. I needed to understand how they communicated, what were social norms. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, Paulie, I've been in the same company for 15 years. I already know all the culture. Maybe you do. I'm not here to judge you. But I'll say this, in my experience with over 70 large transformational changes, we tend to think that the impact that we're going to have for our change is in our team. And we don't always see how it radiates outward to other teams. If you're not looking at your downstream work centers to understand how that's going to impact them and including them in the decision making, you're missing an opportunity. So I say the word change a lot. And here's the thing is, I believe I can change your process, and I believe I can change your tools. I do not believe it's within my power to change your culture, nor do I feel it's within my power to change your personality. So if you can't, then what do you do? Well, what I do is I, I really seek to influence those things. Now, there's a difference between influencing and manipulation. It may feel like a fine line. Influencing, for me, is looking to derive outcomes that are healthy and beneficial for the individual, the team, and the organization. Same for the culture. So how do you influence someone? I, tempt, I typically look at three things. The first are drivers. So what drives this person? Is this individual more extrinsically driven or intrinsically driven? We're rarely one or the other, right? We're usually more of one. Next, I look at incentives. How is the business incentivizing this individual? 
Are they aligned with that person's drivers? By the way, this is an amazing opportunity for leadership to take a layered approach to supporting your change. Of course, you want leadership to come out and say, in like an email blast or an all hands meeting, this is important to me, therefore it's important to the business, therefore it's important to you, or it should be. But by putting incentives in place that help solidify movement and support for transformational change, it takes a layered approach. The last one, and what I think is the most important, are fears. Now, I believe we live in what I call a fear-based economy. Most of the decisions we make in life are based on fears, both big and small. Most of our fears are irrational fears. It doesn't make them feel any less real to the person experiencing those. I'll give you an example. I love to be in the ocean. I love to snorkel. I love to scuba dive. I want to learn how to surf. I live in Seattle now, so I want to go to Hawaii all the time. But I have a fear of being eaten alive by a great white shark. And it's somewhat of an irrational fear. Not that it's irrational to be bitten by a shark in Hawaii. That's probably a pretty reasonable fear. But I can be knee deep in a lake where I can't see the bottom and something bumps up against me. I'm like, that's it. You knew this was going to happen. The first ever freshwater great white attack. It's just where my mind goes instantly. I can't control it. That's that emotional knee jerk response, right? Now, in the case of technology, we tend to look at fears in the lens of loss, loss of control. Now, this is often for middle managers who feel like they have a tenuous grasp, you know, grasp, grasp on uh, control to begin with. Loss of power. Now, in this case, I'm not talking about power over people. I'm talking about power over decision making. As a technologist, we love to be part of the decision. Don't believe me? Go into a Windows shop and say, we're moving to Linux, or vice versa. Right? Immediately, people are like, what? I, I didn't know about this. Did you know about this? How? Because they weren't part of the decision. If it was their decision, they probably wouldn't feel that upset about it, right? When it's your decision, you're like, no, it's t trust me. It's the right thing to do. The last thing is credibility, but the most important is identity. Understanding the identity and the fears around the loss of identity are critical if you're talking about change especially if it's disruptive, impactful change. Give you an example. We had a business that was really needing to focus on reducing cost. Turned out the Oracle licensing was sort of a runaway cost. The way that everything was designed, uh, it was scaling too fast, the cost was. So we decided to move to Postgres. We did a little bit of investigation. Turned out refactoring wasn't going to be that big of a deal. It would be some effort but completely doable. Everyone in that business loved the idea, except for one team. Can anyone guess what the one team was? Oracle the Oracle DBAs. They thought it was a terrible idea. Why? Because that's who they are. That's what they self-identify with. They weren't part of that decision-making either. This is early on in that sort of success stage where I was still learning. I mean, a lot of times, they spent their own money time, blood, sweat, and tears to become an Oracle DBA. Here's the thing. As a leader, it's not your job to not make the right decision for the business just because it's going to be scary or disruptive to a team. You still have to do that. That's what you're there for. But it is now on you to create a path before, during, and after the change for that person. Even if you do all of that, maybe in the end, they're still like, you know what, I want Oracle DBA, I don't want to work on Postgres, I'm out. That's okay. That's kind of how these things work sometimes. So then what do you do with the person who is just like apathetic, doesn't care? Maybe they're vocally against change of any kind. Oh, I cut off the end of the quote. I'm sure you guys can figure it out, though. So this has been a little bit of a struggle for me. It's not always easy to break through to this person. Now, ideally, if you understand the person's drivers, incentives, and fears, it certainly helps you to understand behavior. Now, my suggestion and what's worked well for me is don't give in to that initial knee-jerk reaction of like, well, you're either on board or you're not. And if you're not, that's okay, but you got to get out of the way because we're, we're moving. Don't give up on Bender right away. 
right? I mean, maybe people have been giving up on Bender his or her whole life. Maybe that's why Bender is Bender. I don't know. I'm not Bender's therapist, and I don't think you should be either. Uh, but as a leader and not a manager, you should at least try to understand what's going on there and make an effort to try and bring them on board. Try new things. I'll give you an example. So I had an engineer, was a one-man show, wrote all the software for an internal data scientist team. Did a great job. He was keeping up, no problem. But the data scientist team began to grow. Demand for that was increasing rapidly. It became apparent that I could not scale his team, so I had to scale his process. Now, this was sort of a target-rich environment because he was writing code solo uh, in an older language. I won't say what the language is. I don't want to embarrass him. I'll just give you the initials. It was VB. Uh, you cracked the code. Um, and it was an older VB, not even like a recent VB. And so he wrote the code on the laptop. He deployed by dragging and dropping files into a file share. No documentation, no version control, unless you count you know, folders with timestamps and dates on them. And I asked him, I said, hey, we, we really need to figure out a way to modernize this practice. And he kind of folded his arms and looked at me like a starry-eyed country boy seeing the big city lights for the first time. You know that look, that sort of patronizing, like, oh, it's cute, but I've been doing this for a long time. I don't need your help. It's working. It is working, I agree. But maybe it's not the most efficient way of doing it. So I tried a different tactic, and I said, well, how about you teach me everything that you've done? I really want to understand how you approach problems, right? how you decompose a problem and find a solution, because that's the important part. The, again, remember, we can change a tool and we can change a process. If I can figure out how he was solving problems, maybe that's the right approach. And because I was genuinely interested, he, he agreed. And it was wonderful. It turned out like he was up against some really gnarly problems, and he solved all those. He didn't throw his hands up in the air and say, you know what, this is hard, I give up, I quit. He persevered. And this is exactly the type of person we need. This is the person we want. We just need that person to be a little more malleable on working together and collaborating. In the end, we ended up with a plan that was not that far from the one I wanted, right? He was doing things and solving problems, maybe just not the same way you or I would have done it. So we embraced his approach and started to change his tools and process around that. It was a building, right? That's a first step. So the last one is value. And I say this is the most important because honestly, if you don't derive value at the end of your change, you're just doing change for the sake of change, which rarely is ever a good idea. The problem with value is that we tend to see and perceive value in different ways. Our leadership really saw value from a strategic level, driving that promoter score, increasing revenue, moving into markets, selling up market, right? Which makes sense. Our engineers, on the other hand, perceived value as, get this out of my way, this is painful, I want to reduce tech debt. Now, both of those values are important and real, so we just have to find a way to bring those two things together and align them. Now, with the case of leadership for me, I focused very heavily on vision and sharing a vision with authenticity. Now, I'm not the first person to put this up on a slide, but I am here to validate it. After 70-plus changes where leadership was on board, it was successful. And I can tell you many of those were false starts because leadership didn't really believe in the vision, and that comes through when they would share it. There would be no authenticity. It's really hard to follow a leader that doesn't believe in the change, and you're like, why should I believe in it? I've got enough to deal with already. But here's the thing. There was a combination that we were missing. And once we figured this missing piece out, that's when it really started to produce amazing amounts of value for us. And that was a vision around culture and not just business strategy. It was a piece that we just never really thought about. Again, like I said in the beginning, I was so hyper-focused on getting to the strategy, the results, that I didn't really think too much about the soft skills, about how important it was for leadership to talk about how this impacts our culture. What's the type of culture we want at the end of this change? And measuring success 
not just in whether or not we made $100 million more year over year, but are we a better culture because of it? Are we positioning ourselves now for growth for the long term? Engineers, on the other hand, really look at unique, interesting, fun, challenging, rewarding projects to work on. This is, feeds deeply into our intrinsic desires as engineers. But in order to do this, a lot of times you have to have an environment that's conducive to that. And I know a lot of leaders give a lot of lip service to, yeah, we take risks here, right? It's not until you have an environment where you see somebody really take a risk, right? Fall on their face on that, and leadership goes, awesome, it's a great opportunity for us to learn. First time that really happens, all the other engineers are like, oh, awesome, because I have some pretty cool ideas that I've kind of been holding on to because I was worried about sharing them. In the beginning, we had an issue where engineers basically said, leadership is not creating the environment I need to thrive. So we looked at this, and we kind of turned it on its ear a little bit and said, well, why don't you work with leadership to create the environment together? Why are you waiting for them to create something for you? So what we ended up with was a process where engineers would say what they need and want. Leadership would hear and take steps to make that happen. And then you'd start working in a feedback loop. Was this the right thing? How's it working for you? Do we need to change it? How's this impacting our culture? So collaborating from the top and the bottom and meeting in the middle. And the results were amazing. Not just day-to-day -day happiness of engineers, which is incredibly important to me, but also the bottom line. We were making better software faster. We were completing uh, transformational change at record pace. People were embracing change and sharing across organizations that never talked before. That, to me, was success. I could have easily completed all of my tasks, said, yep, we're all in the cloud now, we're making more money, I'm out. But what would have happened? Everything would have collapsed because they didn't believe it. I was the only one that believed it. But by getting everyone together and everyone sharing in the vision and creating that themselves, even the leadership, even the C-suite, it was almost like we had shared leadership. Right? If you haven't read David Marquet's book, I, I highly recommend it. I bought it for everyone. Leader, leader is a real thing for me. It became a real thing for us. And it's hard, I'm not gonna lie. It's hard for some leaders who have been doing this for a very long time to, to take this step. But, but man, when they do, it's magic. The results are real. The next step, though, honestly, is don't just focus like I did in the beginning on the end result. That's what everyone sees. If you, if you do these extra steps of looking at culture and people, and what is valuable to them, all that hard work underneath, maybe no one will see you doing it. But it will make all the difference, I do promise you. Now, in closing, because I'm a very inclusive person, I created a PowerPoint-ish slide for all the corporate folks in the audience so that you would feel comfortable. I know my approach is unconventional. I get that. I mean, I'm wearing a Goonies shirt. And that's because, honestly, I believe a ragtag group of friends working together on an aligned goal can do anything, even the truffle shuffle, right? So I went to Gartner and said, I'd love to get a sort of Gartner's magic quadrant on frameworks of this matter. And you know, I'm going to paraphrase here. They were saying, hey, who are you exactly? And how did you get this phone number? So I was not able to get a Gartner's magic quadrant, unfortunately. But I did get the next best thing, and uh, that's my grandma's magic quadrant. Uh, and you'll notice I am in the upper right-hand corner. So at the very least, you should at least try these things. I'm telling you they work. I promise you they work. I'm willing to help you. Worst case scenario, you get a hard candy, right? And I mean, who doesn't love a Werther's? If this still doesn't feel corporate enough to you, I'm sorry. Here is an acronym that doesn't mean anything but looks cool, some corporate-approved graphics, and a completely irrelevant pie chart. I recommend you print this, put it all over your organization, and doggedly adhere to it, even if it isn't working. The last thing I need to ask for help, this was kind of easy for me, because the thing that still stands out is that piece 
of bringing the benders on board, not just immediately saying you've got to get out of the way. I care about people. I'm an engineer at heart who loves to work with people. So I don't want these people to just have to leave if they don't have to. Can we find a way to bring them on board, to get them excited? Here's the thing is a lot of times that bender is critical to the success of that change. They can either really take it and empower the change, or they can become a boat anchor and slow everything down. It's rarely the manager. It's often that one technical person, Bob or Mary, that everyone goes to when they have a problem because they trust them. So I don't want to lose them. I'd love to know what you're doing to bring these vendors along on your journey. That's all the time I have. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great conference.